Okay, we're in John 13. Last week we picked, or two weeks ago we picked back up. Last week I didn't teach. Uh, we had, I had to go hunting in my gay garage. My wife had found a bunch of mouse droppings all over the garage Tuesday night, so I had to take Wednesday off and go hunting, and it was a successful hunt. So I didn't teach last week, but two weeks ago, we were in John 13, 1 through 17, um, where we saw, we're, we're, right, we're in the upper room, um, right before the cross, the night before the cross, washes his disciples' feet, and now we turn to verses 18 through 30. Before we do so, would you agree that there is just something about a name? When a name is mentioned to you, certain memories or thoughts and words come forward. Um, the name that we're going to study or read about today is a name that brings forward the, the words traitor and betrayal, right? Judas. It's interesting that there are 5,298,362 Americans named John. And there are only 190 Americans named Judas. I can't believe there's 190, to be honest with you. When I saw that, I'm like, who would name their kid Judas? Like, there's, a, there's a 190 parents out there that said, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's name my kid Judas. I was astonished by that number. 190, wow. So that's what we see today. We're going to see a betrayal predicted, a betrayal questioned, and then a betrayal sealed. Let's go to John 13, 18 through 30. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but the scriptures will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. We'll stop there and talk about this section where we see a betrayal predicted. Not only is Jesus predicting Judas's betrayal, but Jesus in this text shows us that the Old Testament predicted Jesus, Judas's betrayal. Jesus quotes from Psalm 41, 9 here when he says, He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Um, in this psalm, we see David lamenting his betrayal uh, by a close and trusted companion. What Jesus is saying is that that betrayal of David, the companion to David, was a foreshadowing of the ultimate betrayal that meets its perfect fulfillment here in Judas's betrayal of the Son of God. So Jesus makes the connection from this betrayal and says that by saying this, he's saying this is the fulfillment of the, this is the ultimate betrayal. That was the shadow, this is the ultimate betrayal. So he connects it uh, to the Old Testament. And he says it was, the, it was the perfect fulfillment of the scripture, which shows us Jesus was not caught off guard, right? He wasn't surprised by this. Jesus chose Judas knowing that this was the ultimate outcome. We can't miss that. Peter reminds the disciples of this fact. Um, in Acts 1, Peter says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. It was clear. It was all part of the sovereign plan of that was laid out in the Old Testament. Now, of course, at the time when David's writing the psalm, he's got no clue. And this gives us a great picture of, of the reality of the Holy Spirit as the author of the scriptures. It's not just men. It's the Holy Spirit throughout redemptive history using men to write these books. 
It is one story. So we see that it's, it's prophesied. Now, when Jesus says, ate my bread, it means more than just simply sharing a, a meal. I mean, there's a deeper meaning there. There's a sharing of intimacy and fellowship with Christ. During this time when you sat down for meals, there was this fellowship and intimacy. So there was, it's much deeper than just sharing a meal, that, that Judas was there. And then the, when he says lifted up his heel, um, it, it, it's a picture of a horse lifting up its, its hoof to, in readiness to kick. Right? It's, the, it's the, the donkey or the horse lifting up that heel ready to knock you out, right? Knock you out. Which is interesting because Judas just got his heel washed by the one who he was going to kick. But yet he still, Christ still washed his feet. But it's important to recognize that Judas, Judas' role in the divine plan was not separate from Judas' own sinful desires. He was not a robot programmed to betray Christ. He was responsible for his sin here. He freely chose and is fully accountable for his actions. And so in this, we see divine sovereignty and human responsibility playing out here. You see in the scripture, divine sovereignty is clear. This is in the Old Testament. I mean, that's, it's evident. It's happening. But we see the human responsibility in Judas's decision. Judas is born of sin. His nature is sin. And he's going to go that way. God lets him go that way. All of us would go that way. That is our nature. He rescues us from going that way. He's responsible for this betrayal. So Jesus affirmed, both, turn, turn to Luke 22. It's really important. This is a beautiful text that will help bring divine sovereignty and human responsibility together and how they work within the context of this passage here. Luke 22, verse 22. Jesus affirms both divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Speaking specifically about Judas. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. What is that? Divine sovereignty or human responsibility? Divine sovereignty. The Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe... To that man whom he is betrayed. Human responsibility. Woe to him. That's a judgment. That's a punishment. That's a not good, right? So in that verse right there, you see that divine sovereignty and human res Judas's responsibility very clear here. How does it work? Well, because that is, that is all of our bent. We're all going that way. It is only by the divine act of God that we all don't, we, that we don't go the same way that he went. He's responsible just like we are. We are on our way to hell unless he picks us off of that path. Judas was not picked. He went the way that his nature and our nature, if we would not be picked, would go. Divine sovereignty, human responsibility, operating in the Judas situ situation here. Go back to John 13. Look at verse 19. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. I want you to see Christ's heart for his sheep here. The good shepherd. He's preparing them. You are about to experience something that's going to be confusing that's going to make you angry. That's going to make you sad. It's horrific. Know that I'm telling you this now, before that it takes place, so that you have comfort in the midst of it taking place. So you see the shepherd's heart there. In verse 20, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, to whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me sends, receives the one who sent me. You see Christ as the mediator, and he tells them, listen, 
Don't let this Judas betrayal and then my cross be a stumbling block for you to go forward and proclaim. Know that when you go forward and proclaim, if they receive you, they're in fact receiving me. But if they reject you, they're rejecting me. Again, giving them comfort in the reality of the horrific situation that they're about to enter into, preparing them for that, that storm. And then in verse 21, we see that he's troubled. The word troubled is the same word that was used to describe how Christ felt upon seeing Mary weeping after Lazarus dying. Right? So there is a, a, a sorrow, a troubled, turmoil thing going on in this heart. It's interesting, too, because John's gospel is designed to show the divinity of Christ. But yet he does an amazing job showing his humanity when he talks about these kinds of things. So we see the betrayal predicted by Christ. It's coming. Now let's say in verse 22 through 25, the betrayal questioned. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? So the disciples hear Jesus predicting of the betrayal and we see the horrific turmoil and they see the, the turmoil on Jesus' face and they're dumbfounded. They can't figure out, is it me? Who is it? What's going on? Um, they begin to question themselves. Even Judas in deceit, in wickedness, says, and Matthew gives this to us, in Matthew's gospel, Judas's response was, surely it is not I, Rabbi. So Judas, even in the midst of that, is maintaining his uh, deceitfulness. So when you think about these disciples, they hear this. One among them is the betrayal. How heartbreaking is that, right? For the faithful brothers and sisters... It's always a surprise when someone who we've had fellowship with, who has been close with us, apparently um, born again following Christ, we find ultimately was not. And that is a Judas-like situation. The faithful disciples didn't see it coming. They were in utter shock. The effectiveness of Judas's deception no one suspected him. It's the same situation with us when we are in fellowship with people and we come to find out that they weren't actually. Happened in his disciple in the group. We have to expect that it's going to happen without throughout history. And that's why it's very, very important for us to be very careful here to tell people, you said a prayer, you're saved. It's very dangerous. We should never go to somebody here and say, say this prayer of salvation, you're good, you're going to heaven. We don't know that. We don't know the authenticity of those words. We don't, we, and then we give people false assurance for which we will be held accountable to before the Lord. That's horrific to think. We must be very careful on that. Peter, discontent with not knowing who the betrayer was, motions over to the disciple whom Jesus loved. I love this. Put yourself in the room here. Who's the disciple whom Jesus loved? It's John. John, the text tells us, is sitting next to Jesus, reclining, probably back, maybe, maybe he's on the floor, sitting, reclining back, right? Or he's next to Jesus. Peter looks at John and goes, <clears throat> right? So John leans over and asks him, Lord, who is it? Jesus' answer in verse 26. So we see, the, then we see the betrayal sealed. 
Jesus, is, Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered him, entered into him. Jesus said to him, What are you going to do? What you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, but what we need, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. So Jesus' answer to John's question probably was so soft that only John heard it. Remember, Peter says, ask him. Ask him who it is. He leans over and says, Lord, who is it? Jesus probably answered specifically to John, who is the author of this book. It is the one who I give this morsel of bread to. He gives the morsel of bread to Satan, or to, yeah, to Satan ultimately, right? To, to Judas. Um, John recognizes he's the first one that knows it's Judas because John's the one who was told by Jesus, it's the one who I give this morsel of bread to. How do we know that? Well, the disciples couldn't figure out what was going on there. Because look at what he says. Um, verse 29, Simon thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So they still didn't have any clarity John must have had clarity because Jesus answered soft enough for only John to hear it. Now, the morsel of bread would have been unleavened bread and would have been dipped into a mixture of herbs and vinegar. Uh, to be given this morsel of bread uh, by the host um, would have been an honor. So not only does Judas wash, Jesus wash Judas' feet, but he also gives him that morsel of bread, which is a sign of honor to the one who is a, now Satan is entered. By doing this, Jesus is once again showing kindness to Judas in the face of this betrayal. Not only does Jesus have opposition from inside his closest followers with Judas, but now he faces the external opposition of the prince of darkness because now Satan has entered into. Before, in verse, in verse 2 of this chapter, Jesus said that Satan had put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. But now Satan himself enters into Judas. There is a progression here. Put it into the heart. Now he, Satan is in Judas. There is a progression we can't miss. He had rejected the love, the mercy, the grace, forgiveness of Jesus for the last time, and he went his way. Because remember, unless we're redeemed and we're a child of God, in our unredeemed state, we are children of the devil. He is our father. Satan or Judas would fall into this category. And again, we got to be careful that we 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 have to be careful that we, we look at Ju this Judas situation as an isolated incident. It is not. John makes it clear in uh, 1 John two nineteen when he says that they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they were not. They went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. That is a Judas like person. And when we get into, in chapter 15, when we get into the vine and the branches, it's a, we'll see another example of that. A Judas-like, the appearance is connected, part of, but in, in reality is not. In verse 27 through 29, none of the disciples knew what was going on. Again, giving evidence that the answer, Jesus' answer to John was only to John there. And in verse 30, so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. The fact that John mentions that it was night has a deeper significance than just mentioning the time of day, I think. I think that is the, that's the, the day could be referred to as Jesus' earthly ministry, right? 
the night could be referred to as the cross now is coming. The, the sun has set on his earthly ministry and the night has come because the cross is now imminent. Um, the day is over, his public ministry coming to an end. But when we look at the, it's so easy when you look at this, this passage or when you look at Judas to only focus on Judas's betrayal. Like, how could he have done this? I don't want us to miss Christ in this and how he so graciously loved the one that he knew would betray him. That is a beautiful picture of us that we are to model with those that persecute, hate, betray. We are to handle them with the same love that Jesus modeled with Judas. Now we are to handle them with a different love than we love each other. There's a different kind of love for other believers. But we can't deny the fact that Jesus... I mean, what Jesus gave Judas the ability to miraculously heal sick and cast out demons as part of the disciples. Matthew 10, I believe. Jesus washed his feet. He gave him close fellowship with himself and the other disciples. And even when Judas arrived with the Roman soldiers to arrest Jesus, Jesus addresses Judas as friend. So it's a model for us. But the reality is, verse 18, I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen. Judas wasn't chosen. Wasn't picked off of the path to eternal life or to eternal damnation like all of us are on unless God, by his sovereignty, picks us off. Amen? It's horrific. It's horrific. But we do see a beautiful picture of God's sovereignty and human responsibility right there together. Let me read the verses one last time and then I'll pray. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at the table at Jesus' side, so Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you uh, for your grace in uh, saving us. Uh, Lord, we see in Judas ourselves, um, our own sinful nature, uh, that there is no difference um, besides your grace and mercy. Lord, I pray that that would cause us to be humble and thankful. And Lord, I also pray that you would help us to love those who betray us or our enemies or persecute um, the way that you had with the one who betrayed you. So we love you, Lord, and we ask these things in your name. Amen.